right, guys, we're just getting our technical stuff in order with Brooks, and then we'll start and dive into our interview. So are we good to go? Good to go. So good to be with you, Heather. I'm so excited. I have to tell you how I found you. Um, I shared your video or somebody sent it to me about how to stop a bully. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah, actually, that one has 100 million plus views in 20 different languages. And my friend who's a math geek did the calculation. And for a five and a half minute video, I have been teaching people for over a thousand years. <laughs> it's nuts. That is so amazing. So I want to introduce you to everybody who's watching if they're not familiar with who you are. So you're award winning social skills educator. You teach strategies for conflict resolution with a special emphasis on emotional resilience and the golden rule. You're an elite communicator whose message has reached millions through skillful balance with wit and wisdom over 1,500 schools, youth leadership organizations, and have, have hired you uh, for their live events, and you're currently available for bookings, so I highly suggest you check him out at brooksgibbs.com. But let's talk about, I wanna talk about that video since it was this game changer because it was hilarious to see, and I say hilarious because I teach a lot of parents this stuff, but to see it live in action, because they're always saying how, but how, it's impossible. What was really going on there? And I'm gonna post, I'll post the link in the comments on Facebook um, for the video. And then because this will end up on my podcast, on the Mom is in Control podcast, I'll post a link in the show notes there if you guys have no idea. But they could probably Google it, how to stop a bully, uh, Brooks Gibbs, and find it online. Awesome. So can you talk about that? Like what was the transition? What was really happening there? And how can we as parents empower our children to do the same thing? Well, I think the uh, greatest form of education is modeling. So, you know, it's best if parents can practice the very skills that they're encouraging their kids to, uh, to use. And one of those skills being resilience, emotional resilience, and then also the golden rule, not being mean to people, but actually treating them the way you want to be treated. And I ask people, how do you want to be treated? Like a friend or an enemy? And they always say, friend, I want to be treated like a friend. I said, okay, we'll put that in the golden rule. I'm going to treat others like friends because that's how I want to be treated. And some people say, well, what, what do I do when there's an enemy in my life? Well, uh, that's why the golden rule was actually invented. We don't need a social skill to teach us how to be nice to nice people. We need a social skill to teach us how to be nice to mean people. And over 3,000 years ago, this wonderful instruction, it's the first social and emotional learning instruction that was ever invented. It was given to humanity. And it says, treat others, that's social, how you want to be treated, that's emotional. And so it assumes, if you really geek out on the golden rule, it assumes that they're not treating you in a way you want to be treated. Or it would say treat others the way they treat you, but that's not what it says. That's the law of reciprocity. Is you treat others the way you want to be treated. So treat others like friends. Treat your friends like friends. Treat your enemies like friends. And it doesn't mean be friends with my enemy, but it means friendly to my enemy. And so to answer your question, that's the zoom out. Now let me zoom into exactly what you asked. Why is this so powerful? Why does it work? Because as I model in front of the child who's uh, the victim, who says, Brooks, how do I... This kid's bullying me at school. I, I don't know how to respond to them. It, it's breaking my heart. It makes me so angry. It's pushing my buttons. I say, okay, how about, how about you bully me, I tell the kid, and say everything mean that he's saying you, say, say to me. And I'm going to react the way you've been reacting, which is uh, treating them the way they're treating you. So if they're mean to me, I'll be mean to you. And then we play a second time where I'm going to use the golden rule. I'm going to treat you the way I want to be treated. I'm not going to get upset. I'm going to treat you like a friend. So this is called the golden rule game. It was invented by school psychologist Izzy Kalman. It demonstrates modeling. It combines three modalities of learning, which is uh, auditory, visual, and kinesthetic. It is, that's why it's so powerful. That's why people, when they see it, they're like, oh my gosh, you just totally shut that girl down simply by being resilient and leveraging the golden rule. I love that. So it's, what really is happening though, okay, so we're, we're treating other people like they are our friends, right? We're giving them love, we're giving them respect, yeah. we're just, we're not being reactive towards what is coming towards us. So Yes, if we are, then they're controlling us. 
And that's what we don't realize. You know, they, we think they upset us because they're mean to us. And, and so if they're nice to me, I guess I'll be nice to them. But if they're mean to me, then I'll be mean to them. So you can trap them the puppet and they hold the strings. And so it's really empowering the victim to take their power back, which is controlling themselves. You don't have to provoke. You know, if you're provocable, you will be provoked. But if you're not provocable, no one can provoke you. And that's what we're trying to show them. How to contribute to your own disturbed. And, and, and a lot of people don't realize that they are. They are in how they think about the circumstance or the situation. Awesome. So you're cutting out. So I'll start talking and then hopefully the internet will catch up with our conversation. Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. I can hear you clearly. So sometimes it just, it's like, all right, just chill out over there and we'll figure out what happens. This is the beauty of technology, but sometimes we have to deal with it. So, okay. So I work with a lot of parents, the other aspect of it, where maybe they're seeing their child being bullied, right? And I just, the B word is overused now, I, I think, because my kids will come home and be like, I'm being bullied or this guy's a bully. And I'm like, no, that's not what's going on. That's a label. There's, it's a symptom to a deeper rooted problem that's really going on. So there's two things. You know, we're just seeing and observing these these behaviors in our children, whether they are the bully or they're being bullied. And then as the parent, we're becoming reactive because we want to protect and save our children um, or whatever the case may be. And I love what, how you say about, you know, we are their role models. So if you don't know how to like become non-reactive, look past this, you know, use the golden rule yourself of treat your children the way that you want to be treated. That's a whole nother can of worms, but treat, um, you know, teach your children how to treat others. Can you talk about this golden rule, this perspective um, from a parent's perspective, not the child's perspective and how this is sure. counterintuitive to what we're, ta we're taught culturally? Right. Uh, today we live in a culture where the more venomous the words, the more viral. And so the more histrionic, hysterical, theatrical I can be, the more eyes and shares I will have online. In fact, anger expressed via social media is considered a virtue. Wow, you got woke. <laughs> Stay woke. And uh, wow, I mean, that is just counterproductive in the real world where you're dealing with, you know, people on a regular basis at your job or at your school. Uh, so it's so easy to feel empowered and uh, dish out all kinds of um, bold remarks online when you're hiding behind a computer. Uh, but it really, if you really hope for a relationship with those people that you're interacting with, it's, it's not really how the real world works. So parents, when they think um, the golden rule, not only does it govern their um, behavior on how they treat others, but it also governs, listen, it governs how they punish their children. You know, uh, that's the most beautiful part of the golden rule. It's so multi-diverse. Uh, it's, it's got multiple angles to it. Uh, so if my child uh, makes a mistake or, or commits a, uh, breaks a rule in the home, uh, I want to make sure that my discipline or a better word, I like to use my punishment because that's clearly what I'm trying to do. My punishment is not violating the golden rule. And I put myself in that child's shoes. If I made that mistake or if I broke that rule on purpose or unintentionally, all those things I have to factor in, how would I like to be punished? And if you uh, would not want to be punished the way you're punishing your child, it becomes immoral by definition of golden rule. And that's a good governor. Uh, a seatbelt, so to speak, of our punishment and how we interact with children. And it also helps us to have clarity. Uh, if a child comes to me and says, I have this mean kid that's calling me fat at school, it's really hurting my feelings. My uh, papa bear wants to come out and rip that kid's head off and say, who do you think you are, dude? You know, whatever. But then I think, okay, put myself in that child's shoes. If I was at work and someone was making fun of my fat, you know, how would I respond to it? Well, I wouldn't ask someone to take care of my problem for me. That person would probably detest me and, and, and that would only escalate hostilities. Okay. Uh, well, you know what? I would just not give a flying flip. I wouldn't even care. Like what ebbs? And I'd probably comment saying, you know what? The nice thing about being fat is I don't have to wear a sweater in the winter. You know, you probably uh, freeze like, you break like a twig or something, you know, just kind of make a joke about it. All jokes are insults. If I can insult myself, I'm demonstrating mental health and I give that guy no power. So putting the golden rule in my parenting skills actually gives me wisdom on how to tell my child to deal with it because that's how I would deal with it if I was in their shoes. We need to give back to the golden rule. It served us so well for millennia, and it certainly is applicable to today's challenges.
I love this because I always receive feedback from, from parents of like, my child did this and I'm so angry and frustrated. What punishment or, you know, what should I do to them? And I'm like, why are we projecting our anger and frustration? Right. And, you know, it, I, I'm always using my three boys as examples and lessons and, you know, for their own privacy, but there's things that come up all the time in my parenting. And sometimes I go from zero to 60 like that. And I'm like, but this is not the space that I want to be parenting from, right? So then I'm able to shift my energy, come back to a space of like, okay, maybe it's a conversation. Maybe this is multiple conversations. It's not, it's not something you read in a textbook and say, this is exactly how you need to solve this problem. But I like what you're saying because it comes back to a place of um, not traumatic, right? Where the way that our children remember us is not from a trauma place. So you look frozen, but I can probably still hear you. Um, I have another question for you. So just let me know that you can hear me. It cut out. Uh, this internet connection is just lousy. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Your voice is fine. Sometimes you just freeze. So I can hear you perfectly fine. So I know your history. You were a cutter in middle school. I think this is a really important conversation that we need to have because there's a lot of... Um, fear that can be heightened for parents when they're observing their children doing something like this. And again, I'm like, Hey, it's a symptom. It's they're speaking to you. So let's listen, right? Sometimes they just don't know how to use words. So can you talk about that? Um, you know, put who you are now compared to who you were and, and what you would say if you were the father of a child that was doing that now and how you would completely approach it differently. Yeah, I would say don't overreact. You know, if you research cutting, the um, the clinical definite or the clinical name is non-suicidal self-injurious behavior, mm -hmm. and that's so encouraging. You know, because we think they're slitting their wrist. Well, technically, they're cutting their wrist or their thighs or or their stomach. I'm not sure where, um, but it's they're not trying to kill themselves. They're actually trying to live, and this is their coping technique. And physiologically, it releases endorphins in the brain. It gives them somewhat of a jogger's high. It gives them a sense of control over the emotions. For me, it was always like my mom had one of these pressure cookers. And when pressure would come out of the steamer at the top, that's how it felt when I saw blood coming out of my skin. I felt like the anxiety was leaving. Um, so just understand that it's a coping technique. It is addicting. So you do want to consider alternative coping techniques. One thing that I've encouraged kids that I work with is joining what's called the, uh, the butterfly movement, which is um, typically kids who cut have someone in their life that they've lost uh, to death somehow, and they love them, and that was the start of their cutting uh, because the morbid thought of death and the finality of death is so powerful that, um, I don't know, it just triggers it. So what kids do, part of this butterfly movement, is they take a magic marker and they, but they draw a butterfly on their skin and they name it the person that they love whom they lost. And uh, they have an agreement. As long as that butterfly is on my skin that represents my loved one, I will not cut. And so as it starts to fade, I'll draw it again just to make sure. And it's just kind of agreement with me and that loved one that passed. And, uh, and I'll find other ways like journaling or lyric writing, songwriting, um, uh, even uh, talking, you know, conversation therapy with people, journaling, stuff like this. <laughs> what kids don't talk out, they act out. And so it's important to uh, find a way to express it. Um, but you look at two-year-olds and they do this. It's called uh, self-pacification. They, uh, they bang their head on a wall or a floor or, and it looks disturbing. Like, do I have a psychopathic child? No, <laughs> they're calming themselves down. People who have tattoos after uh, a major event in their life to represent something meaningful as a form of non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. Uh, so it's really under a broad spectrum of uh, deep meaning and calming and uh, framing the event that's happened in their life into something that they can control. So don't freak out. Just find out alternative ways that they can commit to, uh, to expressing themselves. Awesome. And do you recommend that when a child or a family is, you know, something like this, it could be cutting, it could be something else, behavior that's really, you know, triggering your fear as a parent, do you recommend that they always seek outside help? Or do you think, because this is another question I get of like, I need to solve this problem for my child. What is the importance of getting professional help? Um, and when you also sometimes feel, because let's be honest, not every single person you come into contact with is going to be a right fit. What is your perspective on that? 
just because they have a degree doesn't mean that they're going to have any way to help you. You know, some people are educated beyond their intelligence, and I run into that all the time. Uh, some of the most mentally unhealthy people I've ever met in my life are mental health professionals, and it's always a dichotomy. Uh, some of the most um, intolerant people I've ever met in my life are those who preach tolerance. You know, yeah. you must be tolerant of everyone or we won't toler you, tolerate you. I'm like, it's a logical absurdity. So I would say use common sense, use some wisdom. Uh, on, there's nothing wrong with looking online and seeing what other people, sometimes social proof is the best thing because other people will be sharing, hey, this worked for me. This is very powerful for my daughter or my son. But yes, of course, seek professional help. Uh, but st don't, don't just jump to the $95 an hour consultant. Uh, go to the people that you know love you and would invest with no strings attached. There's no agenda to their help. And that could be a, uh, a best friend who's got kids that are pretty well balanced. Um, could be the school counselor. Um, could be the pastor or youth pastor or rabbi or whoever else is your spiritual advisor. Um, but man, you could even go to, I think if you, uh, you can get like a, if you want to try out mental health counseling, um, I've heard that doctor on demand is actually a good solution for like 75 bucks. You can get a PhD level psychologist or psychiatrist and just talk to them in the privacy of your own home on your phone and just do a little session. You can get like coupon codes on Twitter or something like that. Uh, but go for it. Okay. A, a mentally healthy person will know when they need uh, a mental checkup or a parent who says, I don't have the answers. And here's a good thing. I think you'll be using this advice if you don't use it already. You don't have to have the solution for your child right away. And you certainly shouldn't punish them right away. You say, you know what? I'm going to have to think about how to respond to this, whether it's advice or a punishment that you have to give them. So I got to figure out a way to, uh, I need to talk to my little network. It may take me a day or, a day or two, but don't you think for a second that I'm going to forget all right, I just need some time to regroup and, and seek seek counsel. That way, when you do talk with your child, they'll say, man, you, that was well thought out. The worst thing we could do is react and only add more problems to their pain. I love that you talk about that with the worst thing we can do is react because it's just an emotional response, right, to what's going on. And, and giving yourself permission to have that reaction, just be my – and if you do react and overreact, then you just come back and say, I'm sorry. I'm going to go regroup. I'm going to come back. I mean, I always tell people the fact that you said, sorry, if you reflect on how you were parented or your parents were parented, like that is a success in itself because we're in this culture of, Hey, look, I'm human, right? Like, please don't put me on a pedestal. I'm just trying to figure this stuff out. So I think it's really great that you talk about, um, you know, the importance of asking about counsel because traditionally it was done in a village and we had our community and now it's just so isolated and you're like, Oh, I got to put on the show. Nobody can see that we're struggling. And we're, we all have our, it's growth. It's the human experience. So to wrap this up, um, I'm a huge advocate. I mean, I'm so grateful that you are here, but the fact that people can just watch this over and over again and know you're not alone, right? There is help out there. Just keep looking, keep looking. It will come to you. And I, I love what you were talking about with your child's behavior and cutting and things like that. Um, what do you ultimately, if you had to define parenting and you don't have to physically give birth to a child, you adopted a child, you are a teacher, children are in your life. Um, what do you find? What is that definition of parenting for you? For, for me, um, it's fueled by love, um, which I believe love is patient and love is kind. So everything I have to do has to show resiliency, long-suffering, and kindness, treating them the way I would want to be treated. But ultimately, parenting or any profession that helps other people is to teach them how to solve their own social problems so I can work myself out of a job. And uh, we do this with math. We do this with science. We say, someday you're going to have to figure this out. You know, so I'm going to let you, I'll be here next to you, but I'm going to let you struggle so you can learn to do it on your own. But we don't do it with social problems. One of our, we think we need to, we think they're powerless to solve their own social problems. So we naturally want to solve it for them. But that's where we make the big mistake. I love giving the problem back to the student and get with some questions that can creatively ask them, how should you, uh, you know, solve this? And if they don't know, then I play the role, role play game that school psychologist Izzy Kalman taught me and people all over the world have seen. And just say, all right, I'll be you and you be the, bully or the mean person and and we'll try a couple different ways of solving this problem and then we'll debrief and talk about which one was most effective and effortless so i don't want 
to solve their problems. That's what parenting is. They need to learn how to solve their problem. And I do that starting very, very young. Give the problem back to them. Say, hey, I'm on your side, but I'm in your face, okay? And I expect you to be mature enough to learn this. So let's, let's learn together. Right. And that's something as simple as, you know, figure out how to get yourself ready in the morning and I will guide you. You know, let's create a checklist together. I'll, I'm, I'm holding space for you or making your own lunch or figuring out, you know, your learning style or, you know, the questions you need to ask your teacher. It's about co-creating and supporting our children and not creating this codependency because of our own insecure needs and what we're not fulfilling within ourselves. You know, and I'll say this, people say, how do you teach resilience in children like that are three or five years old? It, all it is is problem solving. It's awareness that I'm weak. It's self-advocacy. I need help. Please come over here. It's self-management. Wow, I learned to do this. I can do it on my own. And it's, it, which kickstarts an inner motivation, a self-motivation to solve another problem. Because all emotional resilience is built through problem solving. Physical resilience is built through uh, getting hit by pain again and again and again. That's how we grow muscles. We rip apart our physical body or I play guitar and I build up calluses by exposing myself to physical abuse in my fingertips day in and day out. Emotional resilience is not made that way, thank God. It's simply through illumination, education, Oprah aha, that says, oh, I get it. So, okay, I need help. I need someone to teach me how to do this. Okay, I can learn how to do this on my own. Wow, what else can I learn? So if they can learn how to solve problems early on, they will be very likely to be more resilient once they realize, okay, in middle school, this guy's trying to dominate me. Why? Oh, Oh, he's dominating me because he, he's trying to hurt my feelings. I have control over my feelings. Well, then I'm not going to give him the satisfaction of evoking out of me a negative reaction. Shoot, say what you want to say. Haters going to hate. I'm just going to shake it off. They come to that, that illumination, a pattern of problem solving, and through the caring assistance of a loved one, a teacher, a parent, someone who says, I'll help you figure out how to solve this on your own. Yes, I love that. So... Where can people find more of you? What are you up to these days? And yeah, that's all I want to know. Well, I'm all over Facebook, I guess, right now. So facebook.com uh, forward slash Brooks Gibbs. Uh, and you can go to kids.com. Uh, I want my own raise them strong on how to teach your children emotional resilience. Can you hear me? Yep. So raise them strong. You can find video oh, lessons. Well video lessons on how to um, create resilience in your children. Did I get it? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much, Brooks. Um, the video is acting up, so we'll, we'll stop here. But this has been a huge asset to the people that are listening, and I truly appreciate your time and your energy and your dedication to this message. Mm -hmm.